Hello and welcome to the Mission TV show. I'm Natalie Wood and I'm so glad you can join me today. Today we have a special guest with us and um, the verse we have chosen is from Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have our, one of our mission pilots with us today. His name is Arthur Karst. Welcome, Arthur. So glad you can join us. Thank you. And uh, Arthur, you have an interesting history. You're a German. Is that correct? German-born? Yes. No, I'm not German-born. <laughs> I was born as a German, though not in Germany. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was born in uh, Kazakhstan, actually, uh, uh, because of uh, grandparents that, because of the First World War, moved out as far as possible away from the war. Um, I was born in Kazakhstan, but from German parents, and when I was about six, we moved back to Germany. Okay, so the rest of your life you have, have lived in Germany, primarily. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Were you, were you born as a Christ, into a Christian home? Were you... Adventist? Yeah, what is was, your religious upbringing? I was born as a Seventh-day Adventist, so in a Christian home, and um, was raised as an, as an Adventist. But um, with a while, I, I grew up in Germany. I went to school in Germany. And um, as uh, many of us, kind of in the teenager's age, uh, we kind of drift away. We have so many different... Uh, temptations and so many different things that other friends do, party, drinking, smoking, and so I went also kind of this way. And I was not really a Christian, even though I was a Seventh-day Adventist, and I considered myself always as an Adventist. And um, yeah, and it took me a while to, to get back. God had to work quite a bit on my, on my heart and uh, my my parents prayed a lot for me, and I think this was a big part of uh, the reason why I'm here, actually, and the reason why I got, I got on a different way, and yeah. Because of praying parents. Yes, that was, I would say that was one of the main reasons, yeah, and when I was about 18, I moved even out from home because, yeah, my parents, they never liked me doing kind of party and so on. Of course, they wanted me to go in a different way, but as a rebellious, teenager, I just thought, okay, if you don't want to, then I just leave. Goodbye. Were you in a big city or out in the country somewhere? Or my school? parents lived in a small village, in a small village in uh, about, we had more horses in that village than people, so it was like like 400 people living there. and uh, Actually, really, really nice. I moved out when I was 18, I moved to a, a smaller city. It's not a not a big city, but there where I went to school. And, and Plenty of opportunities to party and drink and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, it went, went this way, and I was just you know, having friends all the time, all doing uh, over the weekends, I was gone. And um, yeah, but kind of always, I think the upbringing and the, um, the education that I got in the, in the past, because I grew up with the Bible, and. I always had a bad conscience, especially when I, for example, um, went to parties, especially on the weekends, on Friday nights, and and I knew that actually the Sabbath is uh, it's God's it's special there. day, and and yeah, and when I was doing something, I had sometimes a very bad conscience. When I was back home, back home, I was starting to to read something. My mother always tried to give me books, Steps to Christ, she gave me a new Bible, she gave me different books to read. And so Steps to Christ is probably one of the books that really helped me to find the way to Christ. Okay. <laughs> That's what the book okay. is saying, yeah. 
So okay. she sent you this book or she gave you this book yeah. and you decided to read. Yeah, I was just reading a little bit once in a while and then I put it away because it was almost too, too radical for me. It seemed mm -hmm. like it's talking straight to me. So I thought, like, no, I don't want to read it. I just put it away in the corner. And then next time I felt kind of bad and I had a bad conscience, I started reading it again. And then I threw it again away. And it took me probably more than a year to read this big book. Yeah, this big. big book, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but so so you would you would party and in, enjoy life, yeah. and then you would have this guilty conscience because you knew were, you were breaking the Sabbath and you were yeah. not doing what you, the Lord would want you to do. And then so you'd read the book and then you'd put it away because it would speak directly to you. Yeah, oh, I was okay. kind of realizing that it's um, I'm kind of thinking on both sides, and mm -hmm. I I was. I never like this. I always like to kind of focus on one thing, and I and that's why I realized it's something is wrong about that. And yeah, and just about uh, when I was 20, um, the end of 2005, I was at a little evangelistic campaign, and uh, that touched my heart so much. So I, I even decided to get baptized. At that time, I, I wasn't really thinking too much about it. I was still doing party, but from that point on, life started to change. I started to think more about what I was doing. I started to, when I was partying with friends, I just thought, why should I drink? Because the next day I'll just feel bad. You know, I'll have a headache, this. So I stopped drinking. I thought, I can still do party, but without drinking. But when you don't drink and you go to this clubs or something, you just realize everybody seems just so dumb, kind of <laughs> drunk, and you're kind of the only one who's And so I started feeling even bad going there. So after a while being just the driver, I stopped going there. And um, that was kind of the end of my school time as well. And, and I always wanted to go out, to go out somewhere far away in a different country and just like somewhere in the jungles. And so I applied at uh, Adra for, for a year as a student missionary. And I got accepted. I was never expecting that they would accept me because I was kind of a little bit overemphasizing my knowledge of English and Spanish and every language because I was so bad actually in school. You know, my languages were really bad. And so I got accepted and right at that time also I met the first time young people that were really on fire for God. So when you went there mm -hmm. to do the service or was it before you went? It was actually before I went. I, f I met a few young people that went to Nicaragua and Mexico as student missionaries before, and one of them was studying uh, theology already after that, and their life changed a lot. And, and as I saw them and as I talked with them and uh, realized that there are also young people that are really on fire for Christ and on fire for mission work, that was kind of the first time I experienced something like that. I, I never saw it, kind of the church where I grew up, it was not something, uh, yeah, young people would do party and it's the most normal thing and they would drink and, but that- It's to love God with yeah. your whole heart and be on fire for and him. And that really that changed my whole mindset when I saw other young people on fire and I thought, man, I want what they have. And, and so I just thought either, you know, all the way for God or not at all. And that was the time when I went to Honduras. I was accepted for this one year in Honduras and that changed my whole life. I was there, I was studying the Bible. I had this one friend, he came, he was my roommate from the States. So he helped me to learn my, Eng my English, a little, <laughs> to get my English a little improved. And uh, we were studying the Bible, we prayed together, we cried together sometimes even. And it was, it was so amazing. It was really like, like when, you, when you study the Revelation and it speaks about and the first church that they had, they had lost their first laugh. And I felt really like this was the first laugh. This was this, I was so on fire. It was a, such a great time. One year just working with children in an orphanage and uh, studying the Bible and just lots of physical work and, and the Bible. That was kind of. <laughs> so God was, became real to you in Hondur Honduras. I yeah. Can't, can't yeah. even speak to and, and actually from there yeah. on, I decided to just put my life into God's hands and I wanted to go full-time in the mission work. I, d I didn't want to go back into my old life. I thought, no, there has to be something better. I just enjoyed it so much. I thought, I, I want to enjoy it my whole life this way. And so, yeah. Okay, so then the next step that brought you here, what's between those two? Oh. Between ADRA and then ending <laughs> up taking mission pilot courses? That oh, that's actually kind of 
a long way. I tried to make it short. I went after Honduras. I went to Mission College. I went first uh, to the GYC in the States. I visited the first time the States at the end of 2006 uh, okay. with my friend. We went to Baltimore General Youth Conference, and I, I've heard there the first time about mission schools. I never heard about mission colleges, mission schools, health evangelism, all of this. I've never heard about it before, and there I was really like, man, that is, that is something that I want to do. Uh, short training, you know, getting ready and moving forward. And so I almost ended up going to uh, one of the mission schools here in the States, but then I discovered that just at that time, a mission school was opening in South Germany. It was as if God opened it for me. Well, just when I came back from Honduras. Timing. I went to the Mission College in South Germany, so I went to Mission College. After Mission College, I did health evangelism. There was also a course in Austria, TJM, Training Center for Health Mission. It's like the Wildwood course we have here, the six-month course, health evangelism, how you can help people in natural ways, with natural remedies, with massage, hydro treatments. And that was amazing also to study all of this, learn all of this. And uh, then we went to the Philippines on a mission trip. Uh, and while I was in Mission College, actually, there we went for 10 days to Czech Republic, to Prague. And there was an OCI retreat, OCI re leadership retreat, uh -huh. um, 2008. And uh, I already heard a lot from about David Gates, and I saw some sermons, and I was really like, uh, I was really kind of standing behind it, and I was like, wow, that is amazing. That is amazing. And even as a little boy, I always wanted to fly and to, but I could, my parents always told me, my mother especially, as a pilot, you'd have to work on, you know, on Sabbath yes, and yeah. Sundays on the weekends, so it's nothing for you. So it was just a dream, but it's, dream. it was kind of buried somewhere. Oh. Yeah, and so when I was at this OCI retreat, I met David Gates and Norbert, and I spoke with them quite a bit. and. In this time period, I was actually deciding where I want to go, what I want to do after Mission College, after Health Evangelism, after all of that, where to serve. And I was talking with many different uh, projects, and I was invited to different places. And I kind of, I was praying so much. All these 10 days, well, intense days of prayer, of studying, of searching, where to go. And uh, just as I spoke with, uh, with Norbert, kind of David was very busy and I don't like standing in line to talk with someone. <laughs> so I talked most of the time with Norbert and I just asked, how is it? I mean, is there a need for mission pilots? Oh, yeah. You know? And he's like, of course. Yeah. And I thought so many people probably want to do it, so it's probably impossible to even get into that. And, and then I actually started to really think, man, I might, I might even do it. I mean, why not? And just by thinking about that, I got such, such a joy in my heart. I was like, wow. Your dream is, could be realized. Yeah. Your, your longing to fly could yeah. be used for God's work. Yeah, kind of combining. And it the, wouldn't yeah. be a problem with the Sabbath. Yeah, because. combining God's work, I mean, full-time work for God with the dream of like flying. And it's just like, wow, amazing. <laughs> yeah. So you saw God. Yeah, giving opening. you the desires of your heart. Yeah, <laughs> and, and really since I got uh, converted, since I got baptized also, 2006 I got baptized before I went to Honduras, uh, I realized that uh, step by step God was giving me the dreams that I had in my past, but I never thought they would be realized. When you start dreaming your dreams with God, He starts realizing them. And, and it was amazing, yeah, going to another country, that was one of my dreams. It was the first, first one to be realized. And then a few more, and another one is uh, the one about flying. And, and so I went into that direction. I started to get in contact with gospel ministries. And uh, I think the end of 2008, I was here in the States the first time at Wildwood, and I spoke with David Gates. And, uh, and so God opened the doors to this, into this direction. I didn't even have to go to, a, normally the requirement was to go to a project for like six months of gospel ministries, yes. but because I was already for one year in Honduras, David said, if I can get some, some you know, recommendations from, from there, where you've stayed, that would be okay. So God just opened the doors and I, I was kind of accepted into the program and yeah. And now you're almost done. Yeah, and now I'm already almost done. Yeah, I'm almost finishing my commercial license right now. Even though the way to get here was Sometimes not a very easy way, and you s I saw really that Satan tried 
a few times to, to interrupt, to, to close everything down, to, to not make it possible. Why don't, you, why don't you share with us one of those times? <laughs> <laughs> At least one of those times. Yeah, one of the, the probably most obvious things that happened was uh, the beginning of January this year. Uh, it was the 14th early in the morning. We were planning with a friend of mine, Darren Lee, um, to fly over to Canada to visit some friends. I have some friends over there to the Canadian border. We wanted to go on a long flight. So we decided to fly out very early in the morning. He went over to pick up a few things at Wildwood and I wanted to pick him up at Jasper Airport to fly out from College Dale, pick him up at Jasper because it's closer to Wildwood and then we'll fly together to Canada. So in the very early morning, I packed up everything. I refueled the plane, it was still dark. It was a black night. You could, I, you could barely see the hand in front of your eyes. It was so dark, I, as I remember. And as I got into the plane and I, I taxied, I could hardly taxi because you couldn't see anything. It was just black and it, and yeah, I taxied over to the runway, did my calls, I did all, my, all of my checks. And as I departed, um, gave full power, I rotated, I left the, the runway. And at that moment, you don't see the runway lights anymore. And if you don't see the runway lights anymore and you have a really black night, um, you don't see anything. You just... You can get you, disoriented. Yeah, you can get disoriented very fast. You have to rely on your instruments. It is really actually a very nice object lessons that we have in uh, aviation that we can... Um, apply to us that, you know, God has given us also an instrument. And if we just rely on our feelings, we might crash. And so that was very similar with my experience. I was, at that time, I was not a very experienced, I was just a private pilot. I had already a few night flights at night, but um, I departed, I felt quite comfortable in that airplane. I, right after takeoff, I started uh, doing something on my GPS. And I was not really paying attention at a few instruments where I should have paid attention a lot. Mm. I was kind of very, oh, I'm just doing this, this, and then I looked around and I saw my attitude indicator that shows me how I am in relation to the horizon. And it, I saw that I'm banging to the left oh. quite, quite strong already. And I'm like, whoa, I started correcting to, out of the bank. In that moment, I felt that I hit something. Oh. It was already too late to correct. And I just I hit something and you then... Hit, you hit a tree? Yeah, it you was the tops of, uh, of the trees. And uh, in that moment, things go through your mind like uh, that your instructors told you all the time as, an, as a pilot, if you have a crash, you normally die. Mm -hmm. uh, and insurance just, just does something for your parents, maybe life insurance, not for you, your dad. So in that moment, all these thoughts are going through, through my head and I was like, okay, that's my last few seconds. And yeah, I went nosedive, full power into the ground. It was so fast, I had not even time to, to pull the power back or something. I had full power still, like, like a takeoff, and just went between the trees into the ground. And um, that, was, that was amazing, actually. The whole thing, it was just a huge miracle. One miracle after another. I mean, that I, first that I survived it, I just realized that I, I was, I felt blood all over and, but I felt that I'm still alive. I felt that I can move, I can move my hands, I can move my feet. And I just realized, yeah, I turned off all the electronic devices and, um, and in a shock situation like that, you sometimes don't think about doing something. You just need to realize what's happening. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, as if I heard a voice, get out of there, get out get out of the plane, and I, I got nervous. I got really nervous. I was sitting there, I was trying to push the door open. I was able to push it open. I got out of the plane, I just stepped about five steps away from the plane, and everything burst into fire. The whole plane, I was just, I was still in shock. I just looked at this fire, it was right next to me. I was standing, and I was just like, I was just asking myself, why? Why am I still alive, actually? And, and whose and voice was, was that that told you to get out? I, I mean, God has done amazing things. I, I really believe that, uh, that he, he took me out of that plane and be, without him, I would have never survived. I would have probably burned in it. I would have been unconscious. And even later, 
after all the investigations, they said they couldn't explain a few things. One thing they couldn't explain was how were you able to survive the impact? Because they said the min power. minor crashes are normally already deadly, minor plane crashes. And I said, I could have survived it. Second thing, how surviving it, even without being unconscious, because my head was hit very strong. This was kind of the major thing. I was, this was all ripped open. It was staged later. Under my eyebrow, it was open. Then all down here was open. I had lost two teeth. And um, yeah, I was not unconscious. I could get out of the plane. And another thing is not even one bone was broken. No inner bleedings. The, the doctor couldn't believe it in the hospital. And they took me and I said, uh, at the end, after all the x-rays and all the results, uh, he just came over to my room and he said, um, he just checked me and he said, I couldn't believe when I saw all the results. I couldn't believe that nothing is broken. Like as if, and, and later when I spoke with the FAA that did the investigation on the whole plane crash, uh, when, I, when I came to him, first he took his uh, head off and he said, it is an honor to talk to you, give me his hand, because mm -hmm. I no normally do not get the privilege of talking with a pilot after a crash like that. And he explained everything and he said a few things uh, that they couldn't explain is uh, how, they said the only place that somebody could survive in that plane crash was the captain's seat where I was sitting, uh, the pilot's seat. And he said everything else was absolutely not survivable. It would be dead right away. And he said, we don't even know how it was possible that this seat was so good preserved, as if some kind of hand was above the seat. And I was like... Maybe a guardian angel wing. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was one thing. And then oh, another thing... The Lord. Yeah, the whole ground around the airport, airplane was soaked in gas because I had more than uh, 50 gallons of fuel with me. It was full. You had yeah. just refueled. Yeah, and the whole ground was soaked in gas about this thick. And they said, uh, we, even after everything burned, the ground was still soaked with gas. Normally the gas should have burned as well. And they said, mm. we don't believe why. And I, and I personally uh, explained it to myself because I was standing on that ground. Mm. I was standing right God next to the plane. God was protecting you. And it was just incredible. So it just gave me a proof that uh, this is the way where, where God wants me. He can, if, if I'm going to go for him and I want to do my best to, to serve the Lord, that he can do out of the impossible amazing things. Yes, what a testimony. Yeah. I mean, from all these different people, everything they can't explain. Yeah. It's uh, only they, explainable by God. Yeah, they said from the human God point of view, you should have died. But, but from as God's you said, point of view, it's affirmation that the Lord can yeah. protect you wherever you are as long as you're doing his yeah. work. And, and you said, you told mm -hmm. me that you felt that this was confirmation that you were doing, you uh -huh. were supposed to be a mission pilot, you were supposed to yeah. be taking this training. Yeah, I really felt it. And I see now that um, if, if, God can, if God can preserve me in such a situation, then, then yeah, nothing is impossible. And I was even asked uh, by the reporters after the plane crash, I, I got some TV interviews as well. And uh, they asked me, why do you want to do this? I mean, are you going to fly again? And I'm like, of course. God has given me another chance. God has shown me that this is the way he wants me to go because, um, and they said, but what, what if you die in the mission field? What if this or that happens? I'm like, I'd rather, die in the mission field working for God and having a meaningful life, a life full of sense than, than being somewhere comfortable uh, in Germany. And, without uh, possibility of dying. Yeah. yeah. You know, supposedly without possibility of dying. Yeah. And I, I think sometimes <clears throat> young people especially, um, in the day we, we live right now is uh, young people take risks all the time. They do, you know, jump out of airplanes, do bungee jumping. and do the most crazy things. I mean, you just go on YouTube, you see so yeah. much what they're risking. I mean, why risking so much just for the sake of the fun thrill. if you can risk it? I mean, rather go and risk it for God. Yeah, rather for eternity. A, for eternity, yes. For having a life for with souls. sense, meaningful. For souls, saving other people's life, yeah. And so I think that is, uh, I would recommend to every young person, just, you know, Think about where you're taking your risks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. 
Um, did you have another, another instance of God's leading that you wanted? I know that's the most dramatic one mm -hmm. and the most obvious for everyone to see, but I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you had any other examples of how the Lord is leading, just as we're closing mm -hmm. here. Just Yeah, as I was, I mean, during flight training, a few things actually happened, and I got involved once in a heavy car crash. I even left this out. It was a... I never saw something like that before. It was like in the movie, the, the car, the tires were flying right next to my, we were, we ended up right in the middle. We were, we have been four people in the car and um, two cars from the mm, opposite uh, direction. They were driving, mm -hmm. they lost their control. They came over to our side and we were like head on. They were heading us. And so one car got crashed from another one. It was like, turning around, was like spinning all around along the road. I was just going on my brakes and I was just like praying. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw tires flying around, cars all around. At the end, we stopped. Um, I just bumped barely the car in front of me and it stopped. And we were able to help the others. And uh, as we went out, Darren and I, we've been in the cars again, and uh, we went out of the car and we just looked around and we saw that everything around us was just like, the cars were destroyed. Yeah, the car in front of us was destroyed. It wasn't even looking like a car anymore. To our side, one car was like, half of it was almost ripped off. The, 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 the car right behind us on the left, one tire was missing. It was kind of on the side and we're like, and we are right in the middle in our cars as if it was preserved by a mighty hand. It just, we, we just got a little bump in the front so, so that we might partake of all of this kind of, <laughs> we can be part of it. And we just, and we were able to help. The one in front of us, he was very seriously injured. The, the man, he, 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 got, he lost his conscious right away. Mm. And there was the ambulance coming and uh, there was one ambulance very close and there was, she, she was alone, there was one lady and we were able to help her. We pushed the car away, we opened the door we, we, together and I was able to kind of hold his head and we were able to be help us actually, as if God allowed us to be part of it. Satan tried to destroy it, but God allowed us to be part of it, just to be a blessing even maybe to others. And, and that's another experience. And it just, it just seems like if you start, if you're committing your life to God, you'll have a major enemy as well. You yes. should never forget that. You don't think that everything will be nice and beautiful and you'll have uh, the most peaceful life. Maybe not the most peaceful, but the most peace in here you'll have. That's Lord, for sure. The Lord will protect you and preserve you. He will. And take you through to His, his plan for you. Yeah, yeah. So what do you see in your near future? You're almost done mm -hmm. with your pilot training here. What's the next step? Um, as soon as I finish my commercial license, I'm already in instrument rated private pilot. I'm, I have already all the requirements for the commercial rating. I just need the check right. I hope I can get it out of the way in about one week already. And the next step is probably going down to Chad. We have one uh, a very experienced uh, mission pilot working, operating in Chad, Gary Roberts. And I'm gonna go work with him for a while, getting some experience, learning out of his experience and um, preparing uh, to Later on, probably go to Guyana uh, and Parima. They are waiting for a mission pilot there and uh, I'll be helping out there. And then there I'll be already more kind of operating uh, in a place on my own. And that's why I need uh, some experience. experience first. And uh, yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with Gary. I think it will be a great experience and getting to know Africa and another language, French. Yes, <laughs> another new language. <laughs> another new language, yes. Okay, so. well, what a blessing. I thank you so much, Arthur, for, for sharing your story with us of how God is leading in your life. And um, I'd like to thank those of you that have watched today, and I pray that you have been blessed and that you will choose, as, as Arthur is doing, that you will choose to apply Joshua 24, 15 in your own life. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And then at the end, he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us on the Mission TV show today. <laughs>